Wishing you a very warm welcome, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it might be, perhaps the middle of the night in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, my name is Anthony Mann. Um, I'm very pleased to, to meet you all. Um, thanks all so much for coming. I should let you know, just as we're beginning, that uh, this session is being recorded and it will be available on video later on. Um, please feel free to say um, in the chat mechanism, um, hello, um, and tell us where you're from. Um, I am from um, Hull in the north of England myself. Is anybody from Hull here? Please say hello. And I'm the head of the career readiness team here at the OECD. And we are perhaps you know, kind of well known for um, the longitudinal analysis we've done on the impacts of career guidance on the employment prospects of young people. And we do a whole range of, of pieces of work. Uh, most recently, we've done publications on job shadowing and career talks with guest speakers, looking at the evidence about how they work and you know, whether they work well and, uh, and how they can work best. Uh, and it's my sort of absolute pleasure today to, to welcome you to day one of uh, this three-day conference. You know, the purpose of this conference is to, you know, to encourage and amplify you know, really interesting kind of research, practice, policy from around the world. And you know, we see this as a forum at the OECD. Uh, where we're fortunate we have a lot of people who come to us and we want to amplify this work. And so over the next, uh, in the next two days, we'll have um, over 40 some different um, sessions, presentations. And if you haven't done so yet, you know, do have a look at our program um, and you'll be able to see you know, what's available when. And you will notice as well that you need to register for, you know, for the different sessions. With Zoom, we have to register for individual ones. So do please make a note of that. Um, all the papers which you're gonna see over these next uh, three days have been submitted to an advisory committee, including uh, practitioners and policymakers and researchers from around the world. And you know, we collectively sort of chose what we thought would be the most interesting and innovative and, and useful uh, uh, pieces of work you know, to share. So uh, we're gonna start very soon, but um, just before we do, we wanna share with you a video from Andreas Schleicher. Um, Andreas is the director of the Directorate for Education and Skills um, here at the OECD. Normally, he likes to sort of join you know, this conference. It's something that he feels very passionately about. But unfortunately, um, he is traveling at the moment. But he did send us a video. And um, I'll ask my colleague, Alison, if you wouldn't mind sharing it. Hello, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second OECD Disrupted Futures Conference. It's a great opportunity to share international lessons on how schools can best equip students for their working lives. And when I look at this fascinating program, so sorry, I cannot join you in person. Over the next three days, we're going to explore how schools can most effectively, most efficiently, but also most equitably enhance the career development of children and young people. During the conference, you can expect 43 different presentations relating to research, relating to policy, relating to practice from teams based in 17 different countries. We'll also welcome contributions from the European Training Foundation, from Teach for All, and of course, from our own OECD career readiness team. This is the second Disrupted Futures Conference. Our first one in, back in 2021 was launched with the presentation of OECD <coughs> analysis of longitudinal data sets in 10 countries. For the first time, you know, dissecting those longitudinal data, we were able to systematically review data to see how career development at age 15 actually you know, impacts and relates to better employment outcomes when those people are at the age of 25 using statistical controls for academic attainment, for social background, and also other things that shape labor market outcomes. Uh, the study confirmed quite a range of predictors of better outcomes for young people. And those predictors clustered around the ways in which teenagers explore, in which they experience, in which they think about potential futures in war. For me, one of the highlights of this second conference is that we're going to see how Teach for All, how the Beacon Foundation in Australia and how the Canadian province of New Brunswick are using those research insights to change the way in which they support the career development of young people. 
Confluence also introduces a paper set of our research into the impacts of guidance. We've made a lot of progress in our understanding, but there's still so much that we have to learn how guidance can actually influence the outcomes of young people in different contexts, in different contexts. And the further conference is the use of digital tools in career guidance. You're gonna see an exciting range of papers that present how new technologies are deployed. In fact, you know, since the pandemic, we've seen such a range of innovative uses of technology for career guidance. In fact, earlier this month, we launched our new OECD observatory on the use of digital technologies for career guidance for youth. And that's a resource that makes it easy for development, the developers of digital resources to see how teams around the world are actually using things like you know, virtual reality artificial intelligence and other techniques to increase accessibility but also quality in career guidance. We're delighted in this conference to continue to amplify, to showcase such work to this global audience. You know, It's a rich program, but I want to pick up one more session on the role of career pathways. You know, those programs help students to explore broad vocational areas without actually closing down options for themselves as they progress through secondary education. They're popular in many countries already, and they're routinely associated with better employment outcomes for young people. In the autumn, we are going to publish a new international comparison of such practice in Australia, in Canada, in New Zealand, in Scotland, in the United States. And these are programs that allow us to reimagine what education can be, you know, bringing learning to life and helping more students to find value and meaning in education. You know. We see how skills are actually deployed, used at the workplace. You get motivated to invest in the development of those kinds of skills. You know. So I just want to thank you for joining the Disrupted Futures 23 conference. I'm very grateful for all those contributing and participating. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from the sessions you attend and also that you will actively contribute to shaping peace. And last but not least, I want to thank, thank the JP Morgan Chase Foundation. Their long-standing support for all this work has been so fundamental for making this happen. Thank you again. Wow. Well, thank you, Andreas. Um, that was great to hear from him. He'd like to say he would like to have been here himself, but um, he is traveling at the moment. Um, we're going to go to our first session in just a moment. It's a plenary session, um, and it's going to present to you some recent OECD work on how career guidance can best respond to inequalities. Um, it's uh, one of the kind of the, the themes of this conference. And if you look at the program, you will see there's a number of sessions um, which focus around inequalities. Remember, you do have to register you know, separately for these different sessions on Thursday and Friday. Uh, particularly, I'd highlight in you know, kind of the very last session, our Friday afternoon session, our final plenary session, where I'll be uh, speaking with Trisha Berry from New Brunswick about uh, a new career education framework, which is very much designed to challenge inequalities. Um, but at this point, I'm going to uh, hand you over uh, and remind you that if you have comments or questions about the papers, make sure you put them in the chat. We'll have a time at the end of our presentations to put some of these questions and comments to our different speakers. We've got a fabulous lineup for you, uh, really sort of like hand-picked people who we really wanted. And we're really pleased um, you know, that David Bluestein was able to chair this session. If you haven't read David's book, Work in the Age of Uncertainty, you have a hole missing in your life. You know, it's a fabulous work. And this has just come out, Rethinking Work, um, a collection of essays, which David's co-edited. So um, I'm really pleased to hand over to David. And David's gonna take you through um, our, our major presentation and a, a series of commentary pieces and examples of practice from around the world. David, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. And I also wanna thank Andreas uh, for that really lovely introduction. So it's a pleasure to be here. I've been uh, really honored to work with Anthony uh, and a few other folks from the OECD Career Readiness Group for the past three years. I have learned so much. Um, I believe this group is doing cutting edge work. And I think 
you will experience this cutting edge um, scholarship um, and policy oriented research uh, today and in the next three days. So uh, I wanna welcome you to this session. Uh, my role will be as the chair. I will have the function of introducing people, which I'll actually do here at the beginning. Um, and I will also have the um, unpleasant task of of um, providing gentle nudges to people who may be going over time. So I'll try to do that, you know, through the through the chat so it doesn't disrupt anyone. Uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, this plenary is a very fitting beginning to this conference, uh, which is focused on 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 again this, this concept of disrupted futures and how schools can best equip students for their working lives. I'm, I have a very deep investment in the content of this presentation. It's been an area I've been concerned about for decades, which is the role of in, inequality and marginalization, intersecting sources of marginalization, and how these intersecting sources of marginalization impact upon um, the educational lives of youth and their transition into their work lives. So um, just to give you a brief overview, um, the first presentation will be um, a really important presentation um, by Xinyong Zhaon. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If not, please um, correct it. I apologize if I didn't. Um, Xinyong will present um, a really thoughtful report that OECD put together that summarizes data from PIAC and from PISA, and that looks at the impact of S socioeconomic status, gender, and migrant status and ethnicity on career readiness variables and on occupational outcomes. I've had a chance to go over some of this report. It is really, really important and it, it could be a game changer for a lot of us. Um, this report will be followed by a presentation by Tristram Hooley, who will be discussing the implications for career guidance practice from this report. We will then hear three practice examples. The first one from Ireland, that'll be presented by Esther Doyle and Carol Gooday. Um, if I mess up your names, please correct me. Um, the second um, practice report will come from a group from Estonia that has been running a project called BREAK. And we will hear today from Thleen Rosolo. Um, and the third presentation will focus on the use of critical consciousness as a means of responding to social inequities. And that'll be led by a close colleague and friend of mine, Matt Diemer, uh, from the University of Michigan in the United States. Um, the session will then move into a discussion of this material um, that uh, Anthony will be facilitating. Uh, I will lead that off with a few comments of my own that'll take about five to 10 minutes. And then we will um, take some questions, as Anthony said, from the chat and feed them back to our panelists and have a discussion. So uh, without any further um, comments from myself, let me turn the floor over to uh, Shen Yang. Thank you very much, David. Um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Shen Yang Zhan. I'm the policy analyst uh, at the OECD Career Readiness Team. And over the 25 minutes, I will present the results of the data analysis as in introduced regarding uh, social inequality in the transition of young people from education to work. Uh, the, the objective of this analysis is to provide evidence and insight to policymakers and practitioners like you uh, working in career guidance. And, as you know, many disadvantaged young people who already face different challenges in the society face further disadvantages in the transition from education to work. And then, of course, um, inequality is still commonplace in the labor market, which in turn um, has influence on young people's career choice. Analysis of labor market outcomes of young people shows that disadvantaged young people often face greater challenges in accessing employment and higher quality jobs. So the analysis on um, how inequality influences career outcomes can provide valuable insights to career guidance policymakers and practitioners. 
In this context, our key question uh, for the report was to understand how inequality influences the transitions of young people as they transition from education to work. So we will uh, look at two groups. Um, so the first one is the inequality among young adults in terms of uh, their labor market experience and then the inequality among teenage students in terms of their career readiness. To answer these questions, we mainly used two sets of OECD data already mentioned. One is student assessment of 15 year olds called PISA. And the other one is the survey of adult skills called PIAG. These data sets are very unique in that um, competencies are measured together with other sets of indicators. This means we can compare social inequalities between individuals who are expected to have similar competencies or performance. This is very important because the effect of social inequalities become more obvious when uh, young people with the same educational attainment or skills at the similar levels end up with different labor market outcomes. Our analysis also builds on OECD career readiness indicators as um, Andreas mentioned earlier, uh, to review the impact of inequalities in young people's education to school. Uh, education to work transitions. I will give you more details in the in later slides, but to briefly mention here, uh, we have 14 indicators in the areas of career exploration, experiencing, and thinking. Among these indicators, 11 indicators are confirmed and three partially confirmed based on the analysis of longitudinal data sets in multiple countries. I listed some of uh, references at the end of the slides for those who haven't had a chance to look at them yet. So we analyzed um, inequality in terms of socioeconomic status, gender, and migrant background. But today I will focus on socioeconomic status. Uh, so the question is how socioeconomic status shapes the labor market outcomes of young adults? and how it related to the teenage career exploration experience and thinking. Socioeconomic status here is uh, largely defined by parental occupation, education, earnings, and possessions. It is the key indicator in measuring socio um, social and structural inequalities in many um, research. For example, students with low educated and low income parents tend to struggle more in their transition into adult employment, even if their own educational attainment or academic performance is similar to their counterparts. And I will show you some, some examples in the later slides. Uh, before we start, um, so in terms of socioeconomic status in PISA, we use the index of economic, social, and cultural index, cultural status, which is a composite indicator reflecting parent education, occupation, earnings, and possession. And in PIA, we do not have the same measurement. So as a proxy, we use the level of parent parental um, educational attainment of the survey participants. This was available in the database. So in this case, low socioeconomic status means that neither of their parents of the survey participants have attained upper secondary education. And high SES, I will use the term SES here to, to be shortened, uh, means that at least one parent has attained tertiary education, so like college and university or above. And I'm going to present six indicators using PIAG and PISA uh, by socioeconomic status. So let's look at the PIAG data on young adults first. So the first one is labor market in engagement. Here we are using NEAT indicators, which is the percentage of young adults who are not in education, employment, 
nor uh, nor training. So the results show that a higher share of young adults with low SES are neat compared to those with higher higher uh, SES. So higher SES means uh, at least one parent uh, who attained um, tertiary level education. So in this graph, you can see that in the OECD, on average, 20% of those uh, with low SES are neat, and only 5% of those with high SES are neat. So uh, there is 15 percentage point difference. And I will show you the same thing with a different measurement in the next slide. So this graph shows the same indicator, but in odds ratio, controlling for other indicators such as skills, education, attainment, gender, and migrant status through a logistic regression. So this odds ratio shows a relative likelihood of one group in reference to the other group. And it allows us to compare one aspect between these two groups while uh, other indicators are being controlled, being equal. So even with those indicators, those factors like gender and migrant status and education being equal, young people with low parental education, so low SES, are on average 3.5 times more likely to be neat than those with higher parental occupation, so high SES people. So if you see the left side, um, countries like Slovak Republic, Slovenia, Poland, show higher disparity, while countries like US, Germany, New Zealand, and Norway show low disparity by socioeconomic status. When in work, Young adults with disadvantaged backgrounds are disproportionately represented in certain labor market segments. So for example, those from low SES tend to work in agriculture, manufacturing, and construction more than those with high SES. So on average across OECD countries that have available data, disadvantaged young adults, low, low SES, work about six percentage point more in these sectors than advantaged young adults. By contrast, advantaged young adults work more commonly in the service sector than their disadvantaged peers. And this is in terms of occupation. So the previous one was about the sector and this one is about occupation. And young adults with high SES tend to work in high-skilled occupations such as managerial or professional occupations more than those with low SES. In particular, professional occupations show the largest gap. So this is measured as ISCO2, the International Standard Classification of Occupation. So 15% of young adults from low SES work as a professional um, compared to 28% from high SES. This disparity by SES across sectors and occupation uh, is related to pay gaps and uh, different working conditions. Similar patterns are shown when we look at the distribution by skills and education level. And then the third one is about the job quality. So in terms of job quality, the results on our analysis are relatively mixed. But in, uh, by, in conclusion, high level SES is generally associated with better access to high paying and high quality jobs. For example, here, young people with high SES in OECD countries are 1.8 times more likely to earn wages in the top wage quartile compared to those with low SES, even when controlling for education, skills, gender, and the migrant status. And only Canada uh, at the right side are uh, the only country where young adults with low SES slightly more likely to earn um, high wages. So based on this analysis of young adults labor market outcomes, 
we can infer how the, the socioeconomic background of a young person can be seen to shape young, uh, their labor market outcomes in important ways. So on average, disadvantaged young people are much more likely to experience needs status than their more advantaged peers. And when working, patterns of concentration appear to be linked to socioeconomic um, background, even after accounting for education and skills levels. Data also show that parent, um, parental advantage strongly influences the progression of their children, notably into higher paying job and higher status employment. So the evidence um, confirms that young adults, young people from more disadvantaged social backgrounds often face additional barriers in converting their human capital as codified it in skills, academic performance, or qualifications into successful employment. While data show that young adults from more disadvantaged backgrounds can expect to uh, face additional challenges in the labor market, it also allows for comparison of teenage career readiness linked to socioeconomic status. As I mentioned, um, the OECD career readiness indicators can give us information about different uh, access to career development um, activities by social economic status of young people. So there are three aspects in career readiness indicators. So exploring, experiencing, and thinking. The so exploring refers to career, um, career conversations, career talks, career fairs, workplace visits, job shadowing, and occupation-focused uh, short programs. And some of our work um, address um, and explain what it, what it is, so you can uh, take a look as well. And experiencing uh, refers to activities involving first-hand experience of workplaces, such as internships. And career thinking includes career uncertainty, ambition, and misalignment. And we will look at this one by one. So first of all, um, this is about teenage career exploration. So students with high SES are significantly more likely to participate in career exploring activities, as I said, such as uh, uh, job shadowing, worksite visit, job fair, or career um, college tour. So on average across OECD countries, students from the top SES quartile, high SES, are up to 1.7 times more likely uh, then students from the bottom SES quartile to experience a career exploring activity. And similarly, um, students with high SES are significantly more likely to participate in experiencing activities as well. Here, for example, on average across OECD countries, Students from high ESS are 1.5 times more likely than those from the bottom SES to do an internship. And now we are looking at the, the career thinking. So first element is career uncertainty. So career uncertainty measures the inability as a teenager to name an expected adult occupation. So we ask in PISA, what, what do you want to become um, when you are 30? So they name an occupation. So this is how we measure the, the career uncertainty. And the evidence on career uncertainty is relatively less clear. So when controlling for other factors like vocational program, gender, migrant status, and reading score. Disadvantaged students in uh, 13 countries that are purple here uh, are more likely than advantaged students to be uncertain about their future career. That means they could not name an occupation when uh, they become 30. And uh, next one is career ambition. So career ambition shows the expectation of working in a high skilled job like CEO or manager or professional um, and or completion of tertiary education. 
So in this aspect, advantage students are more likely to expect to work in high skilled occupations, which usually uh, result in high, pay, uh, high paying jobs and higher social status compared to other jobs like uh, lower or medium skilled occupations. So this remains also true after controlling for gender, migrant status, program orientation, and reading scores as an academic performance. And um, this is also the ambition part. So in terms of the education expectation, so advantaged students are also more likely to expect to complete tertiary education. This is a very strong result. This is the case for all OECD countries. And on average, advantaged students are five times more likely to be ambitious in this regard. And some of the countries has a very high likelihood uh, to expect to complete tertiary education. And lastly, uh, career misalignment shows whether uh, students' education plans are aligned with their occupational uh, ambitions. So if they expect to have high skilled occupation, they uh, have to, ex they are uh, expected to um, also expect to complete higher education. So this disadvantaged students are 4.6 times more likely than advantaged students to be misaligned in their career expectation. This is a significantly strong result, even among countries with strong uh, vocational education and training, such as Germany and Switzerland. There might be um, many different reasons and further analysis required, but this may be related to the fact that these countries offer pathways, tertiary pathways um, towards high skilled occupation without needing to go through tertiary education, either through uh, direct access to examinations or by recognizing work experience. And in conclusion um, about the teenage career readiness, disadvantaged students are commonly less certain and less ambitious about their future careers and demonstrate poorer understanding on the labor market and its relation to education. Such inequalities are also observed in terms of gender, migrant, and also location. We are not showing the results on gender and migrant status, but you will um, be able to read that uh, when our working paper is published. Um, I'm, uh, and the lesson that we learn is that the country difference that we saw suggests that the effects of inequality are not inevitable. So some countries do well and the other countries do not. So we can learn lessons from those countries who are performing well in terms of reducing the impact of these inequalities. And surely we can find a difference in their career guidance provision. And I'm sure that the, the presenters today will uh, share the example. And it is also important to highlight again the results of the career readiness indicators based on longitudinal studies showing that positive teenage career thinking leads to better adult employment outcomes. So um, I hope this presentation is very helpful uh, for career guidance policymakers and practitioners. And now I will give the floor um, Tristram, to Tristram Huli, who will present the career guidance policies that can address social inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Tristram. Well, there we go. Sure, yes, great. Well, thank you for having me. I'm just sharing some slides. Um, so yeah, I've been working with Jean Young and Anthony on this paper. And I suppose I've really been thinking about some of the implications for policy and practice. So I'll just sort of step back a little bit and, and give you some slightly more general thoughts. So where my interest in this area comes from is, uh, well, not so much my interest, which has probably gone back a bit longer than this, but, but one of the things that I sort of first really did on this was working with Ronald Sultana and Rhea Thompson. And we 
published a couple of books which bring together writing which looks at career guidance for social justice and we and, and David very kindly did did the introduction to the second of those volumes but one of the things that we did in the first volume that we produced was to try and sort of redefine um, career guidance to say what, what is it we're actually talking about because definitions matter quite a bit here and we very much were influenced by the OECD definition, which I think it, it has, has been hugely influential, as influential for, for you know, the EU definitions and so on. But what we tried to do was to bring in this idea that career guidance is not just about supporting individuals, but also groups as well. That sometimes people's lives are um, not entirely individual, but they're also bound up with the other people around them. And, and I think some of what we're doing in this work is, is about that. You know, we're not just looking at how some people individually do well or, or badly in their career, but we're recognizing that how you do might be bound up with other people from a similar socioeconomic background, with other people who perhaps share sim similar ethnic characteristics with you or a similar gender or, or, or whatever it might be. So, we're saying that what we're doing in career guidance is giving people a purposeful learning opportunity which supports individuals and groups to consider and reconsider work, leisure and learning in the light of new information and experiences and to take both individual and collective action as a result of this. So this is really what we're arguing career guidance can be. Um, and just building on what, what we've just heard, I think what, what the analysis that OECD have been doing, which, which I think is very, um, has really kind of undergirded a lot of these arguments about career guidance and social justice with some really strong empirical evidence. And, and this plays across not just the, the socioeconomic status that, that Shen Yang has just, just presented, but also against other areas, our other dimensions of, of inequality. So essentially what we found is that disadvantage structures young people's career and that career guidance can support career development and ameliorate disadvantage, and that's important. It doesn't say it can, it can stop disadvantage altogether, but it can, it can make it better for people. But, you know, the, the, the crime really is that despite that, disadvantaged young people often get less career guidance than others, and also less than they need. Um, and, and so, you know, where, one place to start is, well, we want more career guidance, and particularly more for career guidance available for disadvantaged people. I think that seems a, a very basic um, sort of assumption really. But the question then is, well, more of what? And career guidance isn't just one thing, it's many things. It, uh, it can take many different forms. Uh, given this, it matters what we do and why. And so I think we wanna deliver career guidance in a way that maximizes social justice. And we also wanna deliver career guidance in a way that's effective and, and you know, efficacious. And so, and, and I, you know, often will turn to the words of Tony Watts, who is known very well to, to many, to, to me at University of Derby, but also to OECD, where he also worked for a while. And he, he makes the point that careers, education and guidance is a profoundly political process. And because it operates at the interface between the individual and society, between self and opportunity, aspiration, realism, and it facilitates the allocation of life chances, which is what we've just been talking about. So in a society in which such life chances are unequally distribute, distributed, which, which is true for all of our societies, although it's clearly more true for some than others, career guidance then faces the issue of whether it serves to reinforce such inequalities or reduce them. And so this is our, our kind of uh, throwing down the gauntlet, really. It's more career guidance is what we need, more career guidance can make a difference, but what kind of career guidance? So in the book that, that Ronald and Rhea and I produced, we, we advanced this, which is the, the five signposts towards a socially just career guidance, which people have heard me talk about, probably have heard me talk about before. But essentially this draws on the theoretical, but also empirical work that we'd, um, we brought together in those volumes and said, says what, what, type of career guidance is going to be effective to move forward social justice. And so we said, well, the first thing is you need to build critical consciousness. You need to help people to understand the situation they're in and what they can do about it. You need to call out oppression and inequality, uh, you know, as we've just been doing. You need to question what's normal and think about whether it's, it's really right for that to be normal. For example, should girls 
only do jobs that are seen as normal for girls to do and boys only to do jobs that are seen as normal for boys to do. To encourage people to work together. So this is our kind of collective piece. And then also to work at a range of levels. So career guidance is not just one-to-one -one counseling. It's also about intervention into systems, about working with employers, about working with um, local you know, benefit systems, with school systems and so on. So in this uh, project that we've been doing, we, we've, we've tried to ground this in, in sort of actual data and actual practice. So um, we just heard uh, from Xin Yang the socioeconomic disadvantage data. Uh, I mean, it's very clear cut as you heard. I mean, it makes a difference. It makes a difference to young people's careers. It makes a difference to their career readiness. It makes a difference to their likelihood of accessing um, career guidance. We've then also looked at gender and to some extent sexuality and at migrant populations and to some extent at minority ethnicities. And the, the pattern is not quite so clear cut, but what, what is clear is that the, the same sorts of patterns continue, that it still makes a difference. And that you know, people from uh, you know, different, different kinds of demographic characteristics make a, chance, a difference to your careers and your chance of accessing career guidance. So what we've then tried to do is to look at real examples, and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but I'll, ju I'll just take you through a few of them, for some of the main sort of insights really that came out of this in those three areas. So if we start with socioeconomic disadvantage, what we found is that we looked for, for practices, we've gathered them together. So in this, this report, we're going to have a sort of compendium of lots of different ideas and inspirations for how you might challenge socioeconomic disadvantage. But this is what I think these kinds of practices do. So the first thing is they enhance career thinking. So you, you, you engage people in guidance. And so one of the examples I've got here is, is from Australia, which is, is starting careers education young. It's called a little program called Little Ripples. But you engage people in career thinking um, uh, as early as possible. You then leverage institutional social capital. So what we mean by that is the school, the you know, organize, the, the vet college, wherever it is you might be studying, has contacts, has relationships, has social capital that it can give to its pupils, and it should should actively try and give that. And so, you know, example would be in Japanese schools. There's uh, Japanese schools have very strong relationships with employers and and support job search and and transition into employment. You should enable human capital activation, so help people to think about how they're gonna use their skills, provide targeted and intensive support. So recognize that some people are gonna struggle and they might need more help, more support. So an example of that might be in, in Ireland where they direct in additional funding towards disadvantaged pupils. And then also, and this is one that's gonna come up again and again, facilitate the students to make use of family support. So families can be a big help to, um, lower students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Sometimes that's not always perceived by the school, but we actually try and engage them. So if we then turn to gender and sexuality, uh, we can see that we have some similar kinds of things. So what did we find? Well, examples would be developing career guidance practitioners to understand these issues. So particularly in areas they're not, not clearly understanding. So areas like LGBT, um, issues, some career guidance practitioners are not sure how to handle that, they need help and support to do that. Uh, secondly, we want to really be very careful about challenging the internalization of stereotypes. So there's a, a sort of an approach in Sweden, which is called norm critique, which is really about encouraging young people to, to perceive stereotypes, see them and challenge them in their own thinking. So when they think that's not a suitable job for me, we try and uh, you know challenge that and say, well, why do you think that? And so on. We want to build confidence, help people to understand their possibility for doing careers that they might not have traditionally thought they could do. And part of that is developing their actual experiences of non-traditional careers. So we want to get people out doing things that perhaps no one in their family had done through work experience and other forms of, of encounter with work. And then we also want to build social capital. So we really want to give young people an opportunity to have connections with employers, to learn from them, to learn from working people, to have experiences and build social capital that can support their career. If we then look at migrants and minority ethnicity students, 
got some some more examples here again covering similar sorts of grounds so we want to make sure that the students get good career information so for example uh, in turkey there's a program targeting uh, young people from migrant backgrounds to help them to understand their um, possibilities we want to uh, um, actually provide again intensive support a, a lot of uh, particularly with migrant groups they often need a lot of support it's often more complicated than just looking at work and learning choices bound up with lots of issues good example here from Denmark advocating actively for for students um, so not just talking to them but also perhaps intervening into systems so representing their, their needs to employers representing their needs to the school system this is another important role for career guidance again the idea of working with families is very important and, and linked to that we've got what we could describe here as bonding social capital so this is about building on their community so recognizing that the young people who come from ethnic minority or migrant communities have strength and uh, and what you know what's sometimes called community cultural wealth within their own community that they can draw on so they have links they have knowledge they have support and so on and we want to try and harness that rather than fight against it but we also want to develop bridging social capital so we want to move them out of their immediate communities um, and introduce them to other communities so a, a really nice example of that is in Austria where we've got a, a program which is called Godparents for unaccompanied refugee minors and, and that's a, a thing where you're, you're linking unaccompanied refugee minors who are really some of the students who are going to have some of the most difficult experience of, of integrating of building a career and you're, you're essentially linking them up with a kind of family of, of, of native people from Austria giving them a chance to connect to them and uh, gain support and gain the kinds of support that you might gain from families. So all of these things come together. These are different strategies that we can use as we work with career guidance, which moves us slightly away from the possibility of just kind of a blanket application of the same types of intervention across the whole population, but says, look, different groups, different types of students are gonna experience different problems and they're gonna need different kinds of solutions. And we've got some really, sort of very practical examples from these different countries, which show us that, you know, people have tried lots of things and generally we've got evidence that the things that they've tried have been effective in one way or another. So there's a wealth of practice that we can draw on to develop approaches to delivering career guidance for disadvantaged young people. I mean, this does remain an emergent area and there's a lot more that I think we would like to do about this. I mean, and I think when the paper comes out, we probably will have pushed it on a stage further still but this research is I think designed to provide people with inspiration and clarity on what's possible and everything that we're going to talk about in this paper is very clearly a real example that comes from uh, an actual you know an actual context in, in an OECD country so it's something that you know we think you can pick up obviously you'll have to adapt it for your own country your own culture your own circumstances but there are real ideas that you can pick up and work with so some contact details for me if you're interested in, in getting in touch i will just flag that we've also got a website which is called career guidance for social justice we're trying to gather examples of practice on there as well so it's another place that you can look if you want some really concrete examples of the kinds of things that people are doing but otherwise thank you for listening and uh, and i'll pass back to david there thank you thank you tristan excellent presentation i always love listening to you and getting the big picture as well as these great examples. Fascinating. So now we will move to, um, not to Ireland as a whole group, but to the Irish context. Uh, we will hear from Esther Doyle and Carol Budea. Budea. Gilday. I hope I did that. Both of us. <laughs> That's you. great. Thank you, David. Um, Hello, everybody. We're delighted to be here this afternoon. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for us in Ireland to talk to you a little bit about what we do and try to do to support our students in our schools. Um, so myself and my colleague Carol are going to uh, give you a very quick, we've got about 10 minutes, so we'll do our very best in the 10 minutes to try and give you a, as much as we can in terms of an overview of an initiative that we have working currently in Ireland for quite a number of years um, in general. So I'm going to begin our presentation. Um, and, and then I'll just get Carol and myself, we'll just introduce ourselves there as well. So 
we're going to talk to you a bit about what's called delivering quality of opportunity in education called DESH. And DESH in the Irish language, which is our national language, one of our, our languages that we speak, means opportunity. So it's a very important um, cornerstone of this whole program that we're going to talk to you about. My name is Esther Doyle. I'm Senior Inspector of Guidance in the Department of Education. And I'll let Carol introduce herself there now as well. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carol Gilday. I am the newly appointed Assistant Principal Officer, uh, Guidance Specialist in the new Guidance Unit of the Department of Education. Thanks, Carol. So what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we'll leave you the slides. So uh, for people interested in having a look at what we're going to say, because we'll gloss over some of them. And we also have referenced any of the documents or researches and research and publications that we mentioned in this presentation. We have left the links to those at the back on the last slide of this slideshow. So you have all the information you might be interested in if you're interested in further reading. So overall today, our focus is going to be twofold in our presentation. Carol is going to take you through a kind of a general introduction for anyone who's not familiar with what DESH means in Ireland, what the programme entails, how we support schools and how we support students. And it's not just obviously guidance, but our key focus today then will be on what enhanced guidance looks like. And our colleagues have already referenced, uh, Tristan has mentioned there that we have this enhanced guidance. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about how that looks, how we allocate and how we know if we do, if it's working or not, and what evidence do we have. So, I mean, Shin Young and Tristan have both referenced what we already know to be the case, that there is no doubt that young people who come from an educationally disadvantaged background face more challenges. And this isn't an experience that's just in Ireland. We know this is across many countries and it is not something that's new. And we have been well aware of it in our own country for many years. So. We have the number of studies that have tried to track and see what's been happening with our own young people and looking at the gaps that have emerged over the years between the levels of achievement and attainment by those students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and um, compared to their compatriots who come from more advantaged backgrounds. So we know and we have seen the importance of effective and supportive guidance, but a, a guidance that is quality guidance. So that is what we try to promote in our schools. And we're going to talk to you a little bit more, as I say, about that. But we know that there is a strong connection between giving young people opportunities to think, to get really good access to the opportunities to be knowing what's out there for them in terms of um, education pathways, training pathways and career pathways. So our approach in supporting these young people isn't just enhanced guidance, but it is a suite of resources and approaches. And we want to try and drive up achievement, attendance and retention so that they stay in school longer. We have some very significant improvements in our attendance and retention rates since this instigation of DESH. So we know that part is working. We have up towards 80 to 90 percent of our students uh, staying right the way through to the final end stages of secondary school and higher upper secondary. So that's very good. So I'm going to hand over to Carol at this point and ask her to uh, take you through the more general information now. Carol, over to you. Thank you, Esther. Um, so, yeah, so um, I'm going to discuss the national policies and actions in Ireland um, and what we do in general uh, in education to address educational disadvantage. So I think the first thing to look at really is who are the educationally disadvantaged? Who are we speaking about when we when we talk about those who are disadvantaged? Um, and I'm going to refer here to a publication called the Refined DESH Identification Model. It's available on gov.ie if you're interested in, in following it up after this presentation. But it was published in 2022, and it provides an up-to-date, modern um, approach to supporting pockets of disadvantage in Ireland. So within this publication, there is um, a very clear deprivation index to help us define who the educationally disadvantaged are um, in Ireland. So there's a weighted approach. Um, we look at location, so specific locations throughout the country, as you can see here on the map on the left-hand side in the blue areas. And then we also look at the populations within those locations. So what are the populations? For example, is there a large cohort of tra traveler and Roma students? Um, are there a lot of students who who are experiencing homelessness, etc. So we have a very clear way of identifying those who are educationally disadvantaged. 
So um, our Education Act in 1998 provides us with the basis legislation nationally to provide for educationally disadvantaged people. So because, as you see on the right hand side, we have a definition and it's included in our legislation, we are then able in government agencies to provide many policies and measures to address educational disadvantage. And as Esther mentioned, um, our DESH schools, our DESH program, as we're going to as we're speaking about today, is one of a number of different approaches to supporting those who are disadvantaged. On a very practical level, just to give you an example, we offer a school meals program um, in our schools to help students on a daily basis. And we also target specific groups, as I mentioned, such as um, the traveler and Roma population and migrants as well. So there's a lot happening and DESH is one of a number of policies and measures. So with regard to our DESH schools, DESH is a program that was first established in 2005, 2006, um, and it was reviewed 10 years later in 2015. So this review provided um, the basis then for establishing a renewed DESH plan in 2017. And I'm referring to the publication that you can see there on the right hand side of the screen, which is also available on gov.ie if you would like to follow it up after the presentation. So within this DESH plan, five key goals were outlined. Um, um, and just to give you an example of one of the goals, um, it was to implement a robust and responsive framework for identifying schools and individuals who needed support. So in 2017, a goal was set out. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, with regard to the, re the refined DESH model um, from 2022, we certainly do have a robust way to identify individuals and also schools to support people who are in need. So at the current time, DESH supports 240,000 students um, in 1,200 schools, and 322 of those schools are new. They've been added since 2022. So if you look at the figures, that's actually a third extra um, in contemporary times, really reflecting where our population is now and what the current status of Ireland is. So it's a, it's a good intervention, and it's very modern and up-to-date. So is DESH working in terms of retention and achievement? Is DESH working overall? The short answer is yes. Um, and a wider answer is yes, definitely. <laughs> and it's if we look at a lot of different figures, we can tell that the DESH is working. So, for example, in the middle there, you can see the gap in completion rates between DESH and non-DESH schools has narrowed. So it has narrowed between 2001 and 2014, and it halved, in fact. The gap is halved, which is highly significant. At post-primary level, if we look at student retention rates, at attendance rates, and at achievement rates, we can see that there is progress also being made as well. There's still some work to do, but we have a variety of different measures that shows that DESH is in fact working. So what does DESH look like in a school to school basis? On a local level, there are a range of measures put in place to support students. If you're in a DESH school, there's a lot, a lot of supports there for you. So to name one or two, um, students in DESH schools have access to homeschool community liaison coordinator services, um, and they have reduced class sizes. And of course, what we're all here to discuss they have enhanced access to guidance. So enhanced being the same and more guidance. So I'll hand back to Esther to discuss enhanced guidance. Thank you, Carol. So as guidance practitioners and policymakers across the world, we know the importance and value of high quality and appropriate guidance. And what we have strived to do in Ireland is try and target the young people who need it the most. And we want the young people who need it the most to access it in their schooling. So that is what our ambition is as part of that wraparound of suite of supports that we also give them, because we know that we need to involve the parents, we need to involve the community, we need to involve everyone in this. It isn't just enough to provide a guidance counsellor. It isn't just, as Tristan said, just one-to-one -one guidance. It's much wider than that. So what we know is that most students in Ireland receive guidance in their post-primary school settings. We don't have formal guidance as such in primary as yet. It's not to say we won't have it someday, but for now, we target our, our measures into the post-primary sector. Our own research and wider research that goes across the world indicates the power, and we know of this, of the guidance process. And it's more than just a career guidance process. It's a social personal process. It's an educational guidance process and it's a career guidance process. And we know that it has significant impact in terms of raising student confidence, supporting them to access meaningful work placements where their parents and their, maybe their parents are not from Ireland originally 
or their parents do not have the social capital to find the placements in the higher sort of professional areas that we know that their own work may not be associated with. So this is where we kind of bridge that gap and mediate that by putting guidance counsellors into schools to support and help these young people find those placements and help them to access better opportunities for their future. We also know that it can help students to navigate general education application systems, whether it's that their own parents didn't go to university or go on to further or higher education and are not familiar with the systems, or their parents may have come from abroad. So whatever the reasons are, it doesn't matter. We have the guidance counsellors in the schools, hopefully helping young people to understand the systems and the scholarships and other things that come with that as well, and the financial supports that we promote and have in Ireland as well to encourage everybody to have the right and access to education and progression from beyond school as well and ultimately our key ambition is to raise the aspirations and open the young minds to the possibilities that we hope prevail for them in the world of work and in the world of education and careers moving on from what we have just shown you there just to say that we have three types of schools in ireland we have i'm sorry that's right i hate to intervene but we're at, yeah. we're just about out of time okay so i'll really fly through it then david thank you okay thank so you. just to say that in on this slide and people can read the slides after we have double the amount of guidance going into the disadvantaged schools so you see here two full-time guidance counselors versus one in a non-desh school setting we know it's working because we have done some research in the Beyond Achievement Report, which we've associated put into this uh, presentation. And we can see that unlike maybe other countries, our own DESH students in the DESH schools, rather than the ones in the non-DESH schools, our students in DESH schools have access more than five of the career development initiatives or interventions. So we can see that some of this at attention to giving enhanced guidance has translated into better outcomes for our young people in the schools. <coughs> We also have been tracking over the years, this is our last slide, the education indicator indicators in Ireland in terms of progression, both onto FET and onto higher education. And we can see that the different levels of transition rates from post-primary on have improved significantly over the years from where the DESH program began to where it is now. It doesn't mean that we don't have more work to do. We absolutely do. And we know that we have more to do because this still happens to be the situation, which is in 2021, that schools, young people in these schools still would, you know, parents would not have you know, third level higher education, university level education, and their own expectations are still possibly that they're not going to go on to higher education. They may expect to go on to um, less, um, um, say, manual skill jobs or jobs that don't require a university degree. And it's not that universities for everyone, we know that, but it's just that we want them to have the opportunity to think that it could be for them. So I got to wrap up there and say Gaurav Mahagruv, which is Irish in our language for thank you. Thank you for your attention. We have left the slides, as I say, with you. And these are the links to some of those publications and documents. And I'd like to say thank you. Is that OK, David? Did I wrap it up? Fast yes, enough? perfect. Thank <laughs> Thanks you, Esther. very much. And I apologize for going over if I did. And well, I pass it back to you then, David, at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Carol. It's a great presentation. Now we're going to hear about the break project and hear from our colleague from Estonia, Trin Rosalo. So Trin, you take it away. Thank you. And I hope I'm heard. Uh, so I am uh, Trin Rosalu, uh, professor in, uh, associate professor in sociology from Tallinn University, Estonia. And, um, and I'm presenting a work on innovative gender stereotype free career counseling and uh, and a little bit about uh, the ideas behind it uh, what is the practice of new digital uh, devices that uh, has been uh, applied uh, recently so what is the key problem with gender in work and especially making career choices so the first presentation of course highlighted the uh, different types of inequalities uh, and uh, Tristan's presentation discussed more thoroughly also uh, gender as uh, as a way uh, of uh, inequalities to be produced on group level, uh, and uh, then also a, a, an aspect to tackle. But but how to even highlight the key problem? So of course, uh, why then the gender stereotype pre career guidance is important is because. We have been told only 10% of women choose STEM occupations, so it is really um, a prevalent trend across countries uh, that uh, few uh, that women are underrepresented in those fields. Uh, men are underrepresented in education, health, social work activities, and this gender stereotyping, stereotyping of careers is still somewhat a hidden issue. 
when we discuss uh, the uh, uh, factors um, to uh, overall inequality in labor market. And, uh, and we say it uh, with confidence. Uh, so there is a common belief that all professional choices are accessible for both men and women, uh, especially in Estonia, and especially everywhere where you have at least one person. So example of one is enough to say that, okay, everything is open for everyone. And uh, uh, there is no problem, but fact uh, of course is uh, that uh, there are gender stereotypical choices which do result in equalities. Uh, and uh, it has uh, happened so historically that uh, male uh, overrepresented uh, professions estimate higher income and then generate you know, decreased economic opportunities for women. And uh, non traditional choice of occupation can also cause bullying. So, so people may actually want to very rationally avoid those choices. Uh, but then it does result in labor shortages in certain fields. And generally, we can say it is gender stereotypical types that then hide individuality and restrict choices. So you go with the group, you go what is normal to your group, hence this questioning of what is normal is uh, certainly very important. So when we think about uh, gender myths and stereotypes, so there are many and they go across uh, uh, different um, uh, social uh, groups and communities. Uh, but the fact is that of course differences are more distinct within groups. Than, it, than they are between groups of uh, men and women. So, so it wouldn't uh, um, be um, fair for individual making their choice in accounting those. But I think back on bullying and, uh, and economic opportunities. So, so this uh, discussion gets more blurred. Uh, so when we then want to discuss what is the problem of gender in career counseling per se, we can refer to of course, those usual gender myths, stereotypes, and stigmas that our social environment produces, that are in uh, also career counselors. Um, but then there are also occupational stereotypes, the things that career counselors, but anyone in society thinks is uh, proper for one occupation, or what is required in one occupation, given the occupations and jobs have changed so much, uh, that they, they can be considered stereotypes rather than knowledge in many ways. And, but they still limit people making the choices. Then, of course, factually, there is right uh, now in most societies horizontal gender segregation in labor market uh, as well as vertical. Uh, people do make gender stereotypical career choices, but then there are also horizontal inequalities across occupations. So, so this is not that uh, there is gender pay gap only because women and men are paid differently in the same occupation, but there are real differences across economic sectors. So, so this is something that, that is a reality that also has to be uh, uh, had in, in mind. Uh, but even more uh, important is the question, who is tasked with career counselling and where and when does it happen? And I think the previous presentation really tapped into that. It is not that there are career counsellors only who should be responsible for that. Uh, for that, uh, there is a um, uh, whole social circle around uh, the uh, students and young people uh, and also adults, uh, but it's more, uh, um, more common than we think that those gendered career hints are given across the educational curricula in schools rather than challenged across educational uh, practices in schools. So even outside of career counseling as such, we do give so many hints on what is proper and what is not proper. And uh, teachers in different fields do that. So uh, since career related problems are really complex, the single uh, decision also encompasses several topics. And it is not um, uh, difficult to see that, uh, uh, that uh, while making uh, the choices uh, in careers uh, that are not your individual um, uh, preferences, but are influenced by stereotypical and common things in labor market uh, are really uh, making the careers less meaningful or work less meaningful. So, so, so how can gender be brought into career counseling? And I'm just, uh, 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 asking you to remind uh, the examples that uh, Tristan's presentation was bringing. So there are so many things that can be done. Uh, I've listed uh, here uh, several uh, 
specific things that are commonly suggested to, to career counselors, like they do include or questioning the norms. But then our question was, okay, so everyone knows it, but it's difficult to do. So how can gender be brought into career counseling in more easy and fun and yet efficient way? Now, that isn't to be said that mostly it's not done in easy and fun and efficient way, but is there a way that it could be done more easy, fun and still efficiently? Uh, so uh, uh, there was uh, a project. Uh, that um, uh, in, uh, aim to break the limiting um, gender stereotypes uh, in career choices to really just increase awareness about gender stereotypes, but also share experience on professionals, career counselors can uh, intervene in more meaningful way. Um, because we can't say that there isn't gender in career counseling and uh, it's rather that it is there, but in a wrong way. So rather than limiting gender inequalities, it tends to enhance uh, them or support them. So there was a cross-media project supported by European Commission, uh, aiming young people not to follow gender stereotypes or at least question the gen or be aware of the gender stereotypes. It was carried out in Estonia, Lithuania and Iceland. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, one thing to point uh, out here, it was, um, initiated by a gender equality and equal treatment commissioner offices in those three countries, uh, rather than someone from education or someone from labor market. Uh, so, so really uh, focusing on gender uh, equalities. Thus, it is also important that uh, when the, since the project only lasted uh, across three years, uh, it is not any more compulsory to uh, to use the results, uh, but. I'm encouraging you to uh, check uh, this website uh, on this project because uh, even though it is not compulsory at cross school systems to use uh, these insights, uh, all the materials are there and we have plenty of evidence that uh, teachers have been continuing and career counselors have been continuing using them. Because what was created was a new toolbox for addressing the topic of gender stereotypical career choices and it included TV series which has been aired in Estonia several times on public TV, on um, in public TV in Lithuania and in Iceland, uh, and uh, differently from uh, usual uh, hmm, instructive uh, TV uh, series or or video series. Uh, this was really commissioned by by very uh, fr from uh, uh, very um, uh, highly appreciated, highly recognized uh, writers and producers. And actually, the TV series itself has has been recognized with awards afterwards, not only nationally, but also on international level. So, so it also works as a really cool TV series that uh, that people might be actually interested in watching and they can watch it on TV. Uh, but it is instructional in the sense that uh, when commissioning it, uh, uh, we had those ideas that we circulated with writers. Uh, so they were putting in many of those topics that are usually uh, questionable or should be questionable. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's their really potential to make a difference. But the, this potential was enhanced by uh, at, uh, also creating alternative endings for specific scenes within each episode. There are 10 episodes altogether and then specific endings uh, of the scenes uh, were made differently so they were shoot again and there was like how it could be in real life how it could be made better uh, and uh, to help uh, the career counselors and teachers uh, from different disciplines uh, use these uh, resources there were guiding materials uh, prepared by education scientists uh, uh, for um, uh, for uh, how to best uh, design uh, tasks for students, group work assignments to students across different uh, disciplines throughout their education career. Now, it wasn't only these three key things. Uh, there were also photo exhibitions. There were radio shows across those different countries. Uh, games were created that uh, can be easily used. There were trainings carried out for practitioners. There were visits with the young actors. And so, so it was really created something fun and, uh, and teachers 
uh, couldn't help but notice it. But what we also saw that it wasn't only, of course, uh, teachers that we noticed uh, that 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 noticed it. So the TV series actually does ask uh, why not uh, or you know, question what is known. Trin, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's 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 not like me, but we are out of time now. Yes, and we, is, we need to have time for the other presentations. I apologize. Yes, I, I'm I'm really at the at the end. I just wanted to say that these things are available already right now on the website in Estonian, in English, in Russian, uh, Lithuanian, and Icelandic languages. Uh, so uh, the TV series, and of course, has. Uh, has just subtitles in those other languages, but uh, all the materials, uh, how to use the TV series are available uh, and translated uh, for, for different ones. So uh, once again, check the website. Uh, thank you very much. And for questions and comments, uh, uh, please, uh, you're welcome to, to contact. Sorry for taking Thank you that. so much, Trin. Um, now we will move to the presentation by Matt Diemer on critical consciousness. Hi, thank you, David. Thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. I'm trying to move over to a share, which looks like people can see. If the share goes away, somebody just please unmute because I've been in the embarrassing situation of talking and thinking everyone's seeing something that no one is seeing. So here we go. Um, I'm Matt Diemer. I'm going to talk a little about critical consciousness, which I'll dig into and define in just a moment. Uh, first, I want to say I just think the thrust of what I'm going to talk about is going to complement the other talks that have come so far. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, marginalizing social and conditions and equality, which I think is very important. And we've been provided a lot of good evidence about how that limits and constrains the career development of people whose social identities, migrant status, low SES, people of color in North America, um, and mean they encounter more social constraints. And what I want to talk a little bit about is critical consciousness, which is a way of thinking about an inside out or an internal resource among people who are more marginalized typically, how that helps young people combat and uh, navigate, in particular, those conditions. So first, let me define critical consciousness. So defining CC, I'm going to say CC sometimes to uh, have a shorthand. And we've generally agreed on this three-part model. And I'll spend a minute just talking about this up front because I think I'm talking about a concept that isn't as widely known as I'd like. So I'll do some basic definitions first and then get into a little bit of how this matters for the world of work. The first component that we think about is what's often called critical reflection. This is thinking deeply and critically about the historical and structural roots of inequality. So those could be on the round basis of migrant status or race or other social identities, as well as their intersections. The second component we think about in critical consciousness is critical motivation. And this is either the perceived capacity to create change or the motivation to create change in the world. And the third component is critical action, which is uh, often involved in activist behaviors, either individually or collectively, with the key distinction being, we want that action to be something that's taken to intentionally try to disrupt or challenge inequality. So it's not you know, um, something that's done blindly or without thought. So let me read an example, because I think this example might help to illustrate what critical consciousness is. And then in the next slide, I'll show a figure that hopefully makes that even more clear. This is from some previous work we did, and I'll just read it aloud. So as an example, at a high school that disproportionately suspends youth of color, CC or critical consciousness would look like A, a recognition that school disciplinary policies are being applied disproportionately across racial ethnic groups, B, the agency to do something about it, and C, behaviors such as joining a student diversity group, participating in a protest, or talking with school administrators. In contrast, a less critically conscious youth might fail to recognize the disproportionate suspensions, ignore or minimize the underlying racism, blame the students, lack interest, or feel powerless to do anything about it, or avoid talking about or acknowledging the problem. So that's a North American example, but I think the ideas hold true in different contexts and settings. And you know, there's been a number of measures that come out and other empirical evidence that makes us feel pretty confident that this three-part model is something people generally agree upon. Let me talk a little bit more about CC and then I promise I'll move on. So this idea comes from the roots of it are Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator who I assume many of you know, and he thought about this canonical sequence of reflection, motivation, and action, right? So people learn to critique and understand inequality in the world as structural, and then they feel motivated or have agency to act on the world. Then they act, and then the action helps them see the world in a new way. And, and that was a really core component of his thinking and his writing. Those ideas were adapted into a, a model called sociopolitical development theory, which is pretty similar in North America. And it, I'll show a graphic here because I think it might also help illustrate. So similar ideas, in this case, worldview and social analysis corresponds to critical reflection, sense of agency corresponds to critical motivation, 
and societal involvement corresponds to action. And there's this idea that these things are in concert or in harmony in a reciprocal kind of way. I also want to note quickly that CC has been relatively well studied in Europe. So among you know, other studies, a couple of places that uh, this work has been embedded, Portugal, Romania, Spain, Switzerland, Germany, many other nations. Um, I'm situating this in Europe because we're at OECD, but we could talk about other places where CC has been manifested as well outside of Western Europe. Okay. <clears throat> so at first, this might seem like this has nothing to do with career development, but there's been a number of studies over the past 20-ish years um, showing a number of linkages between critical consciousness and greater progress in career development among youth who are more marginalized. When I say more marginalized, typically in the U.S., we think of youth of color living at or near the poverty line. This would correspond really neatly to migrant status or other things in, in other nations. So we'll go to crosswalking and customization, but I think the metaphor or the core ideas are the same. One of the first studies I did was with uh, my advisor, David Bluestein, and in which we found that a critical consciousness, as measured quantitatively, was associated with higher levels of vocational identity and career commitment among marginalized kids. And this is one of the first studies to really establish this linkage, and it ran counter to the guiding idea we had at the time, which was the Ogbu model, um, which in, in essence was uh, the idea, the guiding metaphor was don't talk about inequality with young people because you might discourage them. And this line of inquiry started to try to overturn that idea a little bit. In a follow-up study, that I ran with a former student, we found that critical consciousness was associated with higher vocational expectations. And the effect size, or if you quantified that, it would be a change in vocational expectations. So as a one unit change in critical consciousness, instead of thinking you'd be a garbage collector, you thought you'd be a bank teller. This kind of corresponded into an index of uh, SEI. Then this trend's been replicated in a number of studies, which I won't dig into here, but this linkage between critical consciousness and career development's been replicated a number of times with people finding different associations between critical consciousness and different indices of career development. Some of those are listed here, but there's many others. And there's been a parallel strand of work showing that uh, critical consciousness is associated with engagement and achievement in schooling. So a number of those studies are listed here as well. And if you're a savvy person, you might say, well, is it just that critical consciousness assesses general intelligence or IQ or ability and it's something like that. And a lot of these findings have held when we include some third variable in the model in order to covary out some explanation of this just measuring ability or capacity in some way. And, and this line of work sort of led uh, critical consciousness to be incorporated into the recent psychology of working theory, which um, David was a P key figure in and essentially is a component of that theory as well, which has really taken on and I think helped to animate a new strand in critical element theory, thinking about inequality and justice and liberation. The mechanism here probably isn't super intuitive. So I wanted to spend a minute talking about what that might be. The, the theory here in critical consciousness has this idea that um, people who are more marginalized as they have this capacity to negotiate and challenge and understand structural and social inequalities, um, they have more capacity to self-determine their lives. And that's been a core idea of critical consciousness. And so the, the mechanism here that people are thinking about is there's something about this agency that is unlocked into people as they start to attribute group-based inequality to social causes, more caused by social causes than individual failings, people have more agency. And so Ana Ramosayas, an ethnographer, um, observed this phenomenon among uh, students in Chicago. And for urban residing Puerto Rican youth, she observed a politicized understanding of power, inequality, and historical processes actually involves the most disengaged students in a process of critical consciousness that can serve as a catalyst for entry into more mainstream mobility routes. And so there's this way of seeing inequality as being structurally conditioned and created. And as one understands that and feels capacity to act on it, people have more agency to self-determine their educational work lives is the argument. I wanna to pivot toward one specific empirical example. It's from a paper I worked on in 2018 with Luke Rappé, who's at Clemson University, and Josefina Banales, who was at Michigan as a doctoral student, and now she's an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And what we wanted to do was to try to replicate and extend some of the earlier findings I was mentioning about critical consciousness being associated with career development. And in some ways, this came from some colleagues pushing me a little bit that they would say, you know, like, career development's all well and good, but that's just kind of a psychological trait. Who cares? I mean, was the crux of their critique. And I think there's something meaningful in that to respond to. Now, I certainly agree and feel like career development is important, but we also want to know, does this translate into better or worse occupational outcomes when people are young adults, which I think is often the guiding motivation many of us have. So it, I took on a couple studies that tried to link critical consciousness in adolescence 
to what kind of a, a careers did people attend later in life. So one of the first studies I did in this case was um, applied to a large data set that surveyed young people in the US over many decades. And so we studied um, what happens to young people if they have more critical consciousness in 10th grade and 12th grade? What does that mean for their occupational outcomes when they're about age 24? And what we found here was a, uh, an association, a significant statistical association where young people who had higher levels of critical consciousness in high school attained higher paying, higher status occupations in adulthood. This is after controlling for um, GPA. So again, it's not that this is just smarter kids necessarily having higher levels of CC. And it was, you know, over this long time span as well, we had stronger effect sizes for women than for men. So this was the first study of its kind, and I think it was important to extend work linking critical consciousness in adolescence to adulthood, but we wanted to replicate that. This is the original study. I'll just show it to hopefully not induce a migraine, but to have a reference here if people want to go back and look at it more closely. And to talk a little bit of how we replicated that. So we examined data from, uh, it's called a MEDIC study. We had a large sample of young people who were started with in seventh grade, studied over time. The study is almost exclusively comprised of young people identified as either black, African-American, or white. And interestingly, the study design has uh, the SES or socioeconomic status of participants matched. So the white participants and the black participants have pretty similar SES distributions. We studied only the African-American subsample here, and this is about 260 participants. You can see the gender breakdown there. And this was the question we wanted to test. So we wanted to replicate that earlier study and, and see, is there something about critical action, a component of critical consciousness, when people are just out of high school and a little bit farther out of high school, does it lead to occupational attainment even longer? So we sort of shifted the age range we're studying a little bit. And Long story short, this is what we ended up with. And I'll summarize this figure because it might not be very intuitive. We had an earlier measure of career expectancies just as a statistical control. And what we found essentially was that young people who are engaged in more activism and critical action uh, one year after high school and three years after high school had higher paying, higher status occupations when they were age 29. And this is after um, also controlling for earlier grade point average. So we replicated this earlier finding. And this is the model findices if you're an SEM person like me. And what we essentially found is this pattern where young people who had more critical consciousness in adolescence tended to have uh, higher levels of career expectancies in adolescence and then in turn, higher levels of career occupation in adulthood. So we replicated the earlier finding. So this helps to uh, buttress these arguments about achievement as a form of resistance for young people. So the argument is, if you're in a society that marginalizes people like you based on your social identities, one way to uh, resist that inequality is to achieve within the system, right? So kind of succeeding within the system is one of the arguments here that Dorinda Carter and other peoples have put forth. The example I just went through really quickly also replicates these earlier findings linking critical consciousness in adolescence to career development indices to occupational attainment outcomes in adulthood. And this is another kind of quote that I think helps to illustrate the mechanism from Julio Camarota. And he said, many activities, including education, become difficult undertakings for students constrained by severe social injustices. When these injustices are engaged and critiqued, students begin to clear intellectual and emotional space for education. They become further engaged in learning when their education becomes a means by which to challenge oppressive forces within their social context. So again, there's this way that education, if it can be made relevant and calibrated to the, to the lives of marginalized young people, it can become more relevant and engaging in a way to foster achievement. And I'm going quickly on purpose because we're running out of time, but I did want to quickly talk through what this means for policy and practice. And, you know, there's one kind of broader strand here of uh, a broader theme from this work that there was this really strong, at least in the U.S. and I think in many other places, um, idea or metaphor of don't talk about inequality because it's harmful, you're going to discourage young people. And instead, what this work really points to is having these open-ended discussions about inequality where you're not telling students how they're oppressed or telling students what their social conditions are, but providing opportunities for those discussions in classroom spaces, guidance, interactions, groups, and other things. It seems to be associated with greater progress in career development. Um, and to triangulate that finding, Ellen McWhorter and Krista McGonister, excuse me, did an RCT where they studied domestic violence survivors and they kind of did an uh, experimental design and found that the survivors of DV who had a, a career development intervention with more critical consciousness elements benefited more than students, and excuse me, the intervention participants who did not. It also points to uh, critical schooling models. So Scott Sider and Darren Graves have a recent excellent book on schooling for critical consciousness, and they have a framework, which I'm going to gloss over for now. 
It also points to the importance of having supported opportunities to be engaged and supported in action. So youth adult partnerships are one such model where young people can engage on acting on the world with adult partnership and mentorship and guidance. And it also points to um, ethnic studies curricula, critical race theory, and other kinds of things which are under fire in the US right now, but have a number of uh, empirical studies supporting their benefits for more marginalized people. And also Nate, several studies in the US are requiring ethnic studies cur curricula. Uh, California does, Minnesota will soon, and I'm sure there's other states on the way. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just wrap up a little quickly, but I did wanna thank the collaborators on this work, um, youth organizers and who participated, young people and some of the funding sources for this program of research. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to David and I look forward to the discussion we're gonna have and thank you for the opportunity to talk with all of you. Uh, thank you, Matt. And actually I wanna thank all of the presenters for doing an amazing job, but also <clears throat> responding to my gentle nudges so that we could have some time for discussion. So. Um, the way the discussion will work is I'll take about five minutes to add a few of my own thoughts, and then Anthony will identify some questions, and I'll help to facilitate that discussion. Um, so we'll have an, give the audience a chance to participate in this as well. So a few, few quick comments. I've been interested in uh, inequality for many years, and um, one of the points I want to raise here is that I, I think that the studies that OECD has done have been really, really important, especially in kind of identifying the specific contribution of variables. But at the same time, we're in a phase of thinking about diversity and thinking about diverse constructs of wanting to kind of push toward intersectionality. So I know the statistical push is to kind of create, you know, you know, neat models, but I think we also need to as we move forward to think about how things like social class, race, um, and other factors intersect together. So that might be the next step um, for OECD if they're interested. I think it's, it will be really cutting edge work. Um, the second thing is that I, I think that SES is a very powerful variable. In the US, when we discuss social class, um, we are often critiqued for not bringing race into the picture immediately. So that's a that's a very uh, a US kind of uh, concept. And I think it's an important one. And um, I think it speaks to the degree to which racism has been such a dominant force in the United States, and that it kind of has framed other forms of marginalization. I realize that is different in other nations and other regions of the world. Um, Another thought I had here is, is kind of a challenge for us as career researchers and practitioners. And that is for us, and I think some of the presentations touched on this, is that there's a lot of different touch points that we engage in as career guidance practitioners, where we're working with students, we're working with new models. And I think we need to be really careful in our use of language and in our use of the assumptions that drive our language. Um, so that we don't end up reinforcing classism or racism or marginalization. A number of the presentations touched on this as well. And here I'd like to offer us the concept of colorblindness, which is a very popular construct in the US developed by my colleague, Helen Neville from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And her argument is that when people tell us they're colorblind, they're missing the point on the fact that race is a social construct. And I think we need to also consider this with other forms of marginalization, that these are ultimately social constructions and that we have to make sure that we really see the full depth of these different sources of marginalization. So I don't wanna take any more of uh, the time for this discussion section. I just wanted to throw a few ideas out there. So now, um, Anthony, could we perhaps come up with some illustrative questions? Oh, well, thank you so much, David, and thank you to all our presenters. Um, it was uh, we've had a few comments coming through, and I've been making making my own notes. We have about fifteen minutes for some some additional sort of comments. I've got a couple of quite precise questions. We did have one actually, which I'll take to begin with because it's probably of everybody that's probably work I've been closest involved to, which is about um, uncertainty. We had a question about that and about, um, because a number of the presentations focused on, um, or drew upon it, Shin Young in particular, um, issues around teenage uncertainty and that being seen as an issue. And I think in, in, our, in our analysis here, 
we find that if, if young people can't name a job they expect to have later on, um, uh, you know, statistically, you know, in the analysis, you control for all the factors which you know which influence about who, who gets which job and how well you get paid, and that's seen as a problem. You know, um, you know, young people may change their mind all the time, but what we would see is that they need to be in a situation where they they have a view of their future. And they can make decisions as they go through education about the choices which they make, particularly to get to about the ages of 15 and 16, where it becomes so important. So um, the world is changing very rapidly, but still much is much is the same and uncertainty remains a kind of like a problem. Um, Shinyong, can I turn to you first and just ask you a quick question about your statistical methods? Yeah, we... Um use the database of OECD, PISA, and PIAG, as I explained. And then we use the, the SES um, indicator as uh, introduced and gender and migrant background. Um, so for migrant background, we use uh, foreign born versus native born students. So we compare these group and girls and boys. Um, and we, we run um, logistic regression. So this is, um, if, if I may uh, get into more detail, because this is a categorical variable, uh, so we use logistic regression. So um, whether they are girls or boys, and high SES, low SES, and migrant background and non-background, that's the, the dependent variable. And we control for the education uh, edu so reading scores is controlled and the rest of the factors um, are controlled in, in the regression. And just to, um, to answer, to, just to uh, give a comment to uh, David uh, about the intersectionality, actually we looked at uh, this element because we had a good discussion with Tristram and uh, you know he had a, a great uh, influence and um, uh, influence uh, theoretically, so we looked at it. But uh, the reason that there is uh, not enough uh, research on intersectionality is based on the lack of data. Because when we come, when uh, we kind of a start dividing the sample, it gets really small. But what we could do is the, the influence of mother and father separately into girls and boys. For example, uh, fathers uh, who are in science um, science occupation uh, has some more influence in the boys to become scientists, for example. So this is um, confirmed in the longitudinal data, although we have very limited uh, database, this was confirmed. So there might be more to do with uh, researching in intersectionality, but we might need more bigger data. So there, there will be a box of uh, intersectionality, although it's limited, it's in our paper. Oh, thank you. I didn't realize that. I hope I didn't uh, <clears throat> bring up a complex issue, but um, I'm glad that, that you all have been thinking about it. And um, if there's any way I could support this, I'd be happy to do that. Um, no, I th I th thank you. And I, I think a key thing to, to, to emphasize from Shin Young's um, so like analysis, particularly looking at both the PIAC data of the young adults who are already in the labor market and the PISA data of students who are in school, is that we're able to you know, control for their levels of academic achievement, their level of kind of qualification, their other social background or characteristics to isolate, you know, the, you know, these different characteristics. And I think in this paper, which we ultimately see, you know, we want to be able to make it very narrow and very clear to see, can we actually see something happening here? And I think, you know, very often we can see something happening. Um, and then they, we can follow that through and thinking about, well, here are impacts in the early labor market, this is what career guidance on average is currently doing in, in the various in, in different countries. And here we can see a bit of a gap analysis. Um, I had a couple of kind of other points which, which I kind of just really wanted to, to invite, particularly um, so that Trin and Matt, maybe to comment on, because um, I think one of the key things from both your presentations is that, you know, we should just really, sh when, when we engage with young people, we act, we should not ignore inequalities. You know, um, when we are, when we work with them and thinking about um, how they might approach their futures, it is perhaps tempting to say to children, "Well, you know, all of you, you know, all of you have the capacity to do to anything, and let's have high aspirations for everybody." But uh, I think your presentations are saying, "Well, actually, we want young people to become critical thinkers, 
about how the labor market works and perhaps go into the labor market with their eyes you know kind of more open is, is, that, is that a fair summary um trin or trin or matt do you, do you want to kind of respond to that uh, shall, shall i start uh, so uh uh yes i i do uh, appreciate this this recap and uh, and i don't think we can overlook the inequalities but what i'm also saying is that we are if we're not thinking of those inequalities to be brought in light we are actually really reinforcing those inequalities so we can't be neutral in that sense we, we just it's, it's not possible so our language is either harmful or it's not and usually the not means that we have to make effort towards that and it's it's not only language it's all the approaches it's all this critical thinking uh, that is in widened so um it's also not to say that uh, uh, it's not okay for people to follow stereotypes and sometimes you have other things in mind than just you know creating the best individual uh, targeted tailored uh, career path so so it should be okay but then just the awareness of what is at stake and then that you also are allowed to go for stereotypes is also important but if you're not bringing this to the awareness uh, then then you kind of risk uh, any time you risk the other way, like uh, t t tipping to the stereotype. So that's 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 what I think I want to highlight. Mm. I mean, so thanks, Trin. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Can, yes. I was just going to underscore what Trin had said. And I, I think also Tristram's talk, he had some points that touched on this as well. I forgot the nation, but they had something about kind of debunking stereotypes that they were implementing as part of their guides practice. I would agree and underline what Trin had said. I would just to me, it's always a fine line to do this because I think there is a way that you could talk about inequality that would be very disempowering for young people, right? Like you're from this neighborhood, you're from here, so you're doomed and don't even try. I, I think that's not the way you want that conversation to have. But instead, it's just kind of being curious and have an open mind and open to having those conversations, which I see very rarely in North America, and being open to this discussion of, right, uh, different people have different life chances, but it's not predetermined that if you do things in a certain way, you're increasing your likelihood of being successful. Um, but we want to acknowledge your social conditions. And I think this cuts both ways, right? If you tell a young person who has a clear understanding that society isn't fair and you say you have equal opportunity and everything is fair, then you lose credibility because you're telling that person a lie that they know is a lie. Versus if you just say you have no agency, I think that's also um, a disempowering message. So there's a fine line between wanting to acknowledge people's social conditions, but also that being a guided conversation instead of something you're imposing on people. So. Thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. Mm. I mean, I think one of the things which I mean, sometimes we find when we talk about sort of like, um, guidance and inequalities, and particularly around kind of stereotyping and sort of like norms, is the view that um, it could almost be implied that it's, just, it's the young person's fault that you know they're too blinkered in their thinking. You know, um, girls, why do you think about becoming engineers? You know, so boys think about coming becoming nurses. And, you know, one of the things is that, you know, there are parts of the labour market which historically or perhaps currently, you know, are more hostile to, you know, different people um, of different characteristics. And, you know, we need to, and this is one of the things I think came through, you know, through our presentations, that we need to actively support students to explore for themselves, to allow them to see for themselves and make their own decisions. And without that access to that information, that it's very hard for them to, uh, to go against what's seen you know, as sort of like norms and stereotypes. And there's not been many studies, but there's been a few I'm aware of, which have asked uh, young people whether they're interested in actually seeing um, a workplace where their gender particularly is, is underrepresented. And there's a lot of desire to do it, but it very rarely happens. And so, you know, people should look at the girls' days and boys' girls' days in Germany. It's a really, really interesting model uh, kind of within all of this. Um, uh, turning to, to Ireland, um, to so like to Carol and Esther, I'm kind of really curious about um, you know, what's what's really driving um, um, this work because Ireland's unusual in providing such you know sort of like strong additional resourcing for guidance. Um, is there um, a, 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 is it, is it is a strong belief um, within the country that um, that the ability of different young people to activate their human capital in the labour market is compromised? Um, by by different forces, and it's uh, that that guidance has a real play, part to play and be able to make make things kind of more equal. Is 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 that what's really driving practice in Ireland? Well, I think Anthony Alkman and then Carl can join in as well. Um, I think we we believe fundamentally that um, there are multiple forces, I suppose, that go against young people's opportunities, and that. But we do know that on the positive side, the guidance can unlock 
and can help sort of make the playing field more even. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And we do, we know for many years there were inequalities in our education system. I mean, we didn't have free education many, many years ago. It was only for the wealthy. So even in our own historical educational landscape, you know, we only have free education for everybody in more recent times in, in living memory, you know? So, I mean, we've come from that to where we now have a, a national free education system right to the end of post-primary. And then within that, then we know that what will really strengthen that is making sure that young people whose own parents may not have been able to access education or their grandparents, that we give them every possibility through really supportive guidance in understanding the possibilities without, you know, directing them in any particular direction. And I suppose um, it's probably just something we value very strongly, both our education system and our guidance counselling system. And that's Carol, do you want to add to that? Yeah, you've used the word value, Esther. I was thinking of the word ethos. I feel that the ethos of our education system at large um, is looking at really well-being is coming into the fore very much, you know, the holistic approach to education um, in general. And then also at post-primary level, we have a whole school guidance approach where there's ownership. Every individual who teaches um, a student has ownership in the direction of that student. So I feel the ethos generally of guidance is there, is strong and is, is changing for the better. And that's driving this change, as you mentioned. Anthony. Mm. Um, and, and finally, let me turn to Tristram. And um, just got a couple of minutes left, but um, you're somebody who works with lots of people in lots of different countries. Um, and one of the, you know, one, one of the questions which we had sort of coming up through the chat really was, you know, do people, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to ask this question rather than answer it myself, but, you know, do policymakers get it? You know, um, we've seen in Ireland that, you know, there's a very clear perspective here, but are we seeing sort of policy and practice sort of like changing in, in the light of the understandings which we're sharing now? How far is there to go? Um, I mean, I think, I think policymakers in lots and lots of countries have an interest in, in all of these things. I mean, you know, I talked about Sweden where there's been a lot of work done on gender inequality. I mean, you, we could come up with lots of different countries that have got examples on that. I think where they probably don't, um, or where there's, where there's room to develop is moving away from a sort of very simplistic kind of human capital based perspective, which, which essentially goes poor people or disadvantaged people have a better, have, a, have, have worse circumstances, and we've just got to pile more education on them and, and help them to sort of uh, exit their disadvantage and move into being middle-class people or, or whatever. So I think, I think what, we, what we are trying to argue, and lot, all of us, I think, have been making similar arguments in, in, in different ways, is that there's a lot of, um, that a, an, an understanding of structural inequalities is about more than just you individually are doing badly, and if you if you were kind of clever enough and quick enough, you could you could move out of that. And one of the places in the stuff that I've been looking at that I think that really comes through is in the the countries and initiatives that are really focusing on family and community, and seeing family and community not as a problem that you need to escape, not as the cause of your disadvantage, but actually as a source of strength and value. So it, in in a world in which is structurally which is structurally unequal. It's not your family that are dragging you down. It's not your community that's dragging you down. In fact, those things are a source of strength. And you, and so, and I think when you combine that with the idea of critical consciousness, you really start to move into something that's that's quite helpful because you give people a, a frame of reference for understanding a way forward in their life. And I, I think that's the kind of perspective that we don't see so much from policymakers. I mean, they are concerned, of course, about gender. Uh, inequality. They are concerned about socioeconomic inequality. Um, you know, I mean, the issues with with migrants and racial inequality are a bit more variable across across uh, different policymakers. But you know, it's it's trying to to come up with a new way to address this, which I think I think some of these issues around critical consciousness, supporting families, supporting community, give us some tools to do that. Thank you so much. Um, if we had time. We'd ask about social capital and employers' engagement, but uh, we need to wrap up our conversation here, I'm afraid. Esther, perhaps you, if you had an extra additional comment, you could put it in the chat. I'm sorry, we, we, we don't have time, but back to you, David, for our last input. Yes, well, I think the last input is going to be from our uh, JPM representative, uh, Hanka Boldemann. So um, I would like to turn um, the floor or the screen over to uh, Hanka. 
Thank you so much, David, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a few words to conclude this very rich session and really interesting uh, discussion. So my name is Hanka Bodeman. I'm part of JP Morgan's Global Philanthropy team and our lead on our jobs and skill, skills strategies across international markets. So um, we've been collaborating with the OECD education team on career readiness for a number of years, and I really would like to congratulate uh, you on this uh, kickoff of the conference. Thank all the speakers of this session. And also, um, yeah, thank everyone who is making this conference a success also in the coming days. Um, I think um, the presentations and the discussion uh, that we've shared in this session um, illustrated really clearly um, the importance you know, of the saying, talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. Uh, systemic barriers mean that not all young people have a chance to activate their talent. Um, and I think especially in an era of um, digitalization automation where the labor market is changing quickly, um, there's, a, there's a risk of deepening uh, inequalities um, that we've outlined. So the societal challenge I think that we need to address together is to enable more young people to access the opportunities arising also um, in, in the digital world. And uh, career guidance, career readiness support can be one key tool to achieve that. So it's been really inspiring to hear about solutions uh, to challenge inequalities along the lines of gender, race, social background. And clearly that's an important uh, topic uh, that also uh, we as a company uh, need to address and think about how we prepare young people uh, to uh, compete for good jobs and successful careers. One of the ways that uh, JP Morgan Chase is doing this is uh, through the Global Career Readiness Initiative. Uh, this is uh, a core part of our mission to build a more equitable and inclusive economy. And we aim to uh, support initiatives globally uh, that equip young people with the skills um, and experiences that they need uh, to successfully access good jobs in the labor market. I uh, just wanted to name one example. Um, in Spain, we collaborate with two strong partners, Fundación Bertesmann and Empieza por el Car, to build career guidance and employer engagement across schools in the regions of Madrid and Catalonia. Um, the program has established the role and trained career leaders. And Anthony, you've been uh, closely involved in some of this work. Um, so really creating a new role in those schools, but also supporting schools to build the infrastructure and frameworks that allow them to connect with employers and set up meaningful um, formats for, for students to explore the world of work. Um, public administration has been closely involved in order to integrate this into the school system. So we're really happy that uh, to date uh, this has enabled 16,000 students to benefit from career talks, job shadowing and guidance support and are really hopeful uh, that this will be taken into the future. As an employer, as a company, clearly, um, you know, what we do around funding um, those philanthropy partnership is only part of the story. We also leverage um, the skills of our employees uh, through volunteering and also, of course, our HR capability as a global employer um, to tap into emerging talent. Um, so really outside of or complementing essentially the traditional recruiting methods by focusing on diverse talent that is often represented, underrepresented in those channels. So um, we've heard today, you know, especially for young people from uh, underrepresented backgrounds, it's essential to explore careers and expand the knowledge of opportunities that are out there. Um, so one of the ways that we have supported young people across um, a number of locations is through uh, the Schools Challenge, a program that is uh, delivered in six uh, cities around the world. So this program is designed to encourage underserved young people to explore career interests, particularly in STEM, and to equip them with the necessary uh, skills to make a successful transition into the world of work. So we're now um, in its fifth or sixth year, um, and we're really happy that across the globe, uh, over 3,000 students have taken part to date. Um, 
this is just one example. Uh, we could, um, of course, uh, talk about this much longer. Um, but one, I think, key uh, point from our perspective is the point on partnership. Um, so clearly, we collaborate very closely with education institutions, with nonprofit organizations, and also other employers um, to enable, um, you know, young people and long-lasting relationships uh, to uh, facilitate career guidance. Um, because really only through the partnerships between schools and employers, we can provide this effective insight and pathways into the world of work. So I'll stop here, um, but I want to thank once again uh, the OECD um, team uh, for this really insightful conference. Um, and yeah, thank you to all the speakers today. Okay, so, thank you so much, Hanka, and thank you for the support um, from JP Morgan, it is much appreciated. The work that this group has done under the amazing leadership of Anthony Mann has been nothing short of, um, of transformative, really, really transforming the conversation in our field. So the support from JP Morgan means a great deal. And uh, Anthony's leadership has really helped this group to elevate the conversation. So Anthony, I'll, I'll have you close out. Gosh, you're making me blush, David. Um... But anyway, well, it's actually for me to hand over to Alison, because Alison's going to tell you about um, what to expect over the next two days. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining us for today's session. Particular thanks uh, to the presenters today. It was um, really interesting to get the theme of the conference um, really at our forefront um, <coughs> mind. Uh, so we are looking forward to the next two days of the conference. Uh, if you have not yet registered, um, I'd like to encourage you to do so. You can register on the conference webpage, which we've been putting in the chat and um, you'll see it there again. Tomorrow, there are a couple of sessions focusing on how we can combat inequalities, as well as how we can challenge stereotypes, which really link into what we were talking to do today. On Friday, I'm really looking forward to the sessions that will be focused on enhancing guidance through the use of digital technology. This builds on our work on Odyssey, OECD's new observatory on digital technologies and career guidance for youth. We'll have presentations from Australia, from Finland, from the UK and from Portugal, all about how career guidance is made more effective, efficient and or more equitable through the use of digital technologies. Uh, if you haven't already checked it out, I'd also encourage you to look at the case studies on Odyssey. It is a rich open access repository about what is happening in career guidance around the world. So I'd highly recommend that as well. Well, the, the link is there, uh, Anthony's just put it in the chat. Now, what is great about the next two days is that you'll be able to choose which session you want to attend throughout the day. Um, it's super flexible and guided by your interests. You can check out the program to see all of the different sessions, but don't worry, all of the sessions are going to be recorded, uh, just like today's was, and they'll be put on our website with the presentations after the conference so you can catch up on those that you can't attend. The sessions run from 9 till 12 Paris time, and then again from 3 p.m till 6 p.m. There will be a break in the middle so you can get coffee or stretch your legs. Um, but yeah, please do join us. I would really recommend that you register and come along as there'll be a chance to ask the presenters questions about their area of expertise, just like today, uh, and learn a lot. To register, go to that conference webpage. Um, and throughout the chat, you can join in the conversation or add your thoughts or potentially what's going on in your country um, on social media using the hashtag Disrupted Futures 2023. So again, I'm going to finish it off by saying thank you uh, to all attending. Thank you for the presenters. Uh, the chat is really people have really um, have learned a lot and, and are, are keen to get your presentations to get your links. So thank you for your time. Uh, David, thank you for, for moderating and Henke um, for your contribution as well. Uh, but we'll see you tomorrow. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to the rest of this conference. Thank you very much.